What do we know about the human brain and uh, consciousness? Or to put it another way, what can a brain know about itself? Well, we know it's a configuration of atoms and molecules, chemical flows, electrical currents. Some liken it to, to this, an elaborate computer. But unlike this or, or any other computer that's been built so far, the brain is conscious. It's aware of itself. All that physical activity is accompanied by feelings and emotions. This, this was a, an early attempt to, to try to associate different parts of the brain with different mental experiences. Nowadays we have brain scans. This shows a person when they are meditating and when they are not meditating. But which is which? Which one shows the person meditating? We can't tell. Not from just looking at these, these scans. Not until a subject tells us that that is what they're doing, they're, they're meditating. OK, once they've done that, when we come across the same sort of brain pattern in someone else, say, it's a good bet that it will be accompanied by the same sort of mental experience again. But without a subject volunteering the information about the mental experience in the first place, we'd get nowhere. In fact, why are there conscious mental experiences at all? We don't even know which things are conscious. I'm conscious. I know that from you know, direct experience. You? Well, you have a brain like mine and you talk about having mental experiences, so, okay, I'll, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. How about this? Well, not exactly this, but, you know, a proper chimpanzee. Are chimpanzees conscious? Are they aware of themselves? Well, yes. But what about this? A worm. Is a worm conscious? Could they feel pain? Well, there's, there's one way to find out. Cut it in half and, uh, and see what happens. You didn't really think I was going to do that, did you? But, you know, if I, if I was digging the garden, OK, and my spade accidentally cut through it, well, we know what's going to happen. It's going to to writhe about. It looks for all the world as though it's in agony, but, but no, no, both halves are writhing about. So what does that mean? You know, they're, they're both in agony? It now has two minds, whereas previously it only had one? Or does it not have a mind at all? And what about these? Bacteria. You shouldn't have thought so. The sun? Well, no, definitely not the sun. Humans? Definitely yes. The sun? Definitely no. But where was the dividing line? How, how, how could we ever find out? Suppose when I buy my next updated computer, I start keying something in. Hey! Cut that out. I don't like being tickled. Do I believe it? The computer's ticklish? It's having a conscious mental experience? Or has it simply been programmed to say that? The latest version of Windows. This is the problem of consciousness. How to understand the brain in relation to conscious mental experience. Are we dealing with, with two separate things, a brain and a mind, and somehow they're, they're interacting with each other? Uh, that's one theory, but it's, it's not very popular these days. Or is there just the one thing which we approach in, in two quite separate ways? 
uh, one where we use a, a physical language and we use terms like um, atoms, electricity, spatial orientation, and, and another more, more psychological language where we talk about you know, pain and, and love and happiness, the kind of qualities you would never find in, in a physics equation, all right? And, and, and one needs both, both languages if, if one's going to have the fullest understanding of what's going on. Consciousness poses a, a big, big problem. I, I don't see how we'll ever have a fully satisfactory answer to it, uh, one that everyone agrees about. It's a close encounter of the first kind with what I call the boundaries of the knowable. You see, science, science has its limits. In fact, well, well, one day science will grind to a halt. No more scientific discoveries. Not when we've discovered everything, complete knowledge, nothing more to know, but when we've discovered everything that is open to us to understand, which is not the same thing. Don't get me wrong, it, it's not going to happen soon. And the applications of science, though, they'll continue. Uh, there will be plenty of scope for, for new gadgets and things like that, and updates of, of, of computers and playstations, that sort of thing. Technology will continue, but not fundamental science, not, not, not the discovery of, of new laws of nature. Why do I say that? In the first place, we have to consider what we do our science with. This. But how do we come to have a brain in the first place? According to the theory of evolution, it's something that has been fashioned in past struggles for survival. It helped our ancestors to find food, shelter, a mate. It helped them to, to avoid predators. It was part of their, their survival kit. And that being so, why should it be something capable of understanding everything about the world? That, that wasn't necessary for our ancestors to survive. A second reason why we might not be able to complete our understanding of the world has to do with, with, with practical considerations. I, I'm what's called a, a high-energy nuclear physicist. It means I'm interested in discovering the ultimate structure of matter, what, what, what everything is, it, it is made of and, 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 and what holds it together. To do this, we have to accelerate tiny subatomic particles to great energies and then we smash them together to see what happens. This is what does the acceleration. The, the, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, just outside Geneva, the big international laboratory uh, where I, I used to work. Uh, what we're looking at here is in fact just a, a small section of a great giant circular machine, 27 kilometers in circumference. That's Geneva Airport to show you in comparison, give you an idea of the scale. As a general rule, each time we've built a, a bigger and more powerful machine, we've made discoveries that were quite unexpected. And this raises a question. What if it, what if it takes a machine, say, the, well, the size of the solar system, in order to discover the last crucial piece of evidence? You know, the, there's no reason why the final clinching experiment has to fit in with what we humans happen to be able to afford or, or can physically build. Uh, and without that last crucial piece of experimental evidence, our theories about the world could remain forever incomplete. And then there's, there's a third reason for suspecting that science will eventually fall short of providing us with a, a complete understanding of everything. The fact that we 
can perhaps already discern where some of those limits might be. Stubborn questions that have been around oh, for a very long time. Questions to do with well, the nature of space and of time, of, of matter, of light. Stuff like that. Questions defying all attempts at resolution. Perhaps, perhaps because for us, they are intrinsically unanswerable. They are at the boundaries of the knowable. How are we to understand consciousness is but the first of those questions. Stop sulking, Wally. Sorry if I frightened you. No animals were hurt in the making of this program. Okay. You've had your 15 seconds of fame. It's now time to go back to work in the garden. Okay. Mm -hmm.